All right, thank you for that. Well, we have been uh, in this series called By Faith for the last couple of weeks. Everybody say, By Faith. By Faith. faith. We are um, studying Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, And it's often called the Hall of Faith because Hebrews chapter 11 shows us uh, men and women of God who lived their life by faith. Um, Two weeks ago, we looked at the end of Hebrews chapter 10, which was a call to live by faith. It ended by saying the righteous will live by faith. And we want to be counted among the righteous who live by faith. Then last week, we looked at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, and, and we saw that, fa- that, that without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so we looked at, at just what is faith? We're going to kind of talk about that and review a little bit as we go through this message today. But um, today we're going to be in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 19, verses 8 through 19. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 19. And this passage in Hebrews is going to show us the life of Abraham, Abraham. Several times in scripture, Abraham is called the father of faith. Abraham is the father of faith. Let me read you a couple verses that that give us this picture of Abraham as the father of faith. First, Galatians chapter 3 verse 7 says this, You know then that those who have faith, these are Abraham's sons. Those who have faith are the children of Abraham. That makes Abraham the father of those who have faith. Those who have faith, those are Abraham's son out of Galatians 3 verse 7. And then in Romans chapter 4 verse 16, here's what it says. This is why the promise is by faith. So that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, that is the children, not only to the one who is of the law, but also to the one who is of Abraham's faith. He, Abraham, is the father of us all. Abraham is called the father of faith. And we're going to see the reason is that when God called Abraham out of nowhere, out of the middle of his life, Abraham was not seeking God. Abraham was not looking for God, but God called Abraham. And when Abraham called God, I'm sorry, when God called Abraham, Abraham responded in what? Faith. So everybody say, by faith. By faith. faith. So we're going to be looking at that reality this morning. The life of Abraham is recorded in the book of Genesis. Chapters 12 through 25, chapters 12 through 25. And and this morning, I want you to know that Abraham is a real historical figure. Abraham is not some fairy tale. Abraham is not a, a fable. The life of Abraham is a real historical life. The life of Abraham actually happened. What, what is recorded in Genesis 12 through 25, those are real stories of the life of Abraham. They're real stories of his faith. They're real stories of his failings. They're real stories of his strengths. They're real stories of his weaknesses because Abraham was a real person just like you and me. He had good days and he had bad days. Sometimes he made good on what God called him to do. Sometimes he blew it because Abraham was a real guy. He was a historical figure. Abraham lived about 2000 BC, about 2000 BC. That is 2000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. So that's, that's about 4,000 years ago is the time when Abraham lived. He was born in a place called Ur. And in a few minutes, I'm gonna show you a picture uh, because archeologists have have discovered the site of ancient Ur and they've started to unearth places because it was a real place and Abraham was a real person and and he lived in history. And God called him to faith and he 
obeyed. And so um, we're going to just kind of work through the passage this morning, kind of sections at a time. And we're going to see three things about Abraham's faith. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better place. Abraham looked for a better people. And Abraham looked forward to a better promise. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better place. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better people. And by faith, Abraham looked forward to a better promise. So let me pray and then we'll get into it this morning, all right? Well, God, we love you this morning. We thank you for the truths of what we have already heard and said and saying that you are a promise keeper, that your word will never fail. And so, Lord, help us to wait on your promises, that you, your love truly would be our delight, that you would be our satisfaction, that you would be our hope, that you would be the better place and the better promise that we long for, that we would be the better people that you have called us to be. And so, Lord, speak through your word this morning. God, encourage us, challenge us, change us by your word because your word is truth. We give you this time in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Well, let me read the first part of Gen or I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 8. And it says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. That's pretty clear. By faith... Abraham, when he was called, didn't hesitate, didn't wait, didn't turn around and ignore, didn't say, oh, oh, you were talking to me, okay. No, it says he obeyed by faith. Abraham, when he was called, everybody say obeyed. Obeyed, obeyed. he obeyed. And so it, it starts with a call. Faith starts with God's call. Faith starts with God's call. Abraham was not living as a man of faith when God called him. Abraham lived in a city called Ur. It was a pagan city uh, near Babylon. And over and over in scripture, Babylon is, is the like capital of wickedness. <laughs> in the book of Revelation, Babylon is used as an illustration of like, sin city, like the wicked place. And, and Ur was right next to Babylon. And, and that, was, that was the context that Abraham lived in. He worshiped other gods. He, he lived a pagan life. That's who Abraham was. There wasn't anything special about Abraham, but God chose to call Abraham. And what set Abraham apart is that when God called him, he obeyed by faith. The same is true in our lives. God doesn't call us because we're special, but when he calls us, he calls us to obey by faith. God is the initiator of a relationship. We talk about having a relationship with God. We talk about being children of God, that we can be adopted as God's sons and daughters, but he is the one who initiates that. Like we're, we are not the ones who initiate that. He initiates that call. He initiated it when he revealed himself to men who wrote down his words in scripture, to the prophets and to the patriarchs. He revealed himself when he sent Jesus Christ to be the better and final revelation of God. Scripture is clear that, that God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were still sinners. That means running away from, pointing our guns at him as his enemies. That's when he sent Christ to die for us, to initiate a relationship with him, to call us to salvation and repentance. Scripture says there's no one righteous, not even one. There is none who seeks God. If we're going to have a relationship with God, if we're going to experience faith, then God has to be the one who makes the call, and then we respond in faith. Faith is not a work. Faith is just like, oh, I see it now. <laughs> and we respond in faith. 
Let me read again Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This was the beginning of our series in the book of Hebrews, but it, but it shows us how God has revealed himself to us. Hebrews 1, verse 1 says, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets and at different times and in different ways. In other words, God revealed himself. God called, God spoke to the prophets, the patriarchs different times and in different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, that is Jesus Christ. God has appointed him, Jesus, the heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son of God is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and the Father are one. He sustains all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins by dying a sinner's death on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty because he didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the grave. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. This is God's revelation of himself to us. It started by speaking to the prophets and to the patriarchs like Abraham. But finally, in these last days, he is once and for all finally revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. So man is without excuse. God has revealed himself to us and he calls us to respond by faith. And so this morning, I want us to see in the life of Abraham, it started with God's call. And this morning, if God calls you, if God has revealed himself to you, then the proper response is just like Abraham, to obey. So God calls Abraham. It starts with a call. And then what did God call him to do? He called him to leave everything behind. Let me read a little bit of Genesis chapter 12. This is where the story of Abraham begins. Genesis chapter 12 Starting in verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the people's of the earth will be blessed through you. This was God's call to Abraham. He said, hey, Abraham, leave everything you know behind, your land, your people, your father's house, including your father's gods, and go to a place that I will show you. I'm not gonna tell you where it is yet, but you just start going and I'll get you there. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make your name great. I'm gonna give you descendants and through you, all of the earth will be blessed. So let me show you a map of Abraham's journey, okay? Um, So Abraham lived over here. This is in modern day Iraq. It's a city called Ur. And God called Abraham up out of Ur. And and for a while he lived in a place called Haran. Uh, This is close to like modern day Turkey and Syria. And then Abraham starts to root down into the promised land, which is modern day Israel. There was a famine and so he had to go down to Egypt for a little while and then he came back up into Israel and all along the route, Abraham never had a a, a place to call home. He lived in a tent with all of his people, all of his family, all of his servants. Abraham obeyed, he went where God called him to go. And so I I want us to see this morning that, that God called Abraham to go to a better place. Everybody say better place. God called Abraham to a better place. But Abraham had to leave everything that he knew. He had to leave it all behind. Called him to leave the comfort of everything that he knew, the the confidence of everything that he knew, the culture of everything that he knew and he called him to go to a better place. Let me read these verses again, Hebrews 11, eight through 10 this time. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he didn't know where he was going. 
By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, the co-heirs of the same promise. That is his son and grandson. For he, Abraham, was looking forward to a city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. God calls Abraham to a better place. And Abraham obeyed and and he didn't know exactly where God was calling him, but he left. And when God calls us, we might not know all the answers. We might not see how everything is going to work out. But if God says, hey, come up out of that place, I've got a better place for you. Our proper response by faith is to obey. And Abraham obeyed. He left everything that he knew to go to a better place. It says that he was a foreigner in the land of promise. In other words, he he was never really at home. That's what it means to be a foreigner, right? It's not his home. It was the land that God had promised him, but he was still living as a foreigner in the land of promise. It's a word to us this morning that that as the people of God who are called to a better place, we're not supposed to get too comfortable. I sang it a a few weeks ago. There's this old song, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And, And that's true. Like God has something better for us and, and we live momentarily 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years. And when this life is over, there is eternity and that is what God has prepared for us. But we live for this 70 years like it's the only thing we're ever gonna have and God has a better place for us, but we get so comfortable. We get so comfortable and and Abraham said, you know what, I I guess I'm just gonna live as a foreigner. (laughs) And that's a word to us, that's a warning to us. Are you too comfortable? And I'm not saying life has to be miserable. I'm just saying, what are you investing in? What are you spending all your time on, all your resources on? What do you think about all the time? What are the thoughts that run through your head? What, what are the priorities of your life? And for Abraham, it, it wasn't the place where he was. He lived as a foreigner because God had a better place for him. He lived as a foreigner. Just ask yourself the question, are, are you more comfortable in this world the culture around you, the people around you, the sins around you, the struggles around you. Are you more comfortable than you ought to be? Abraham was called to a better place. And then it says that he was looking for a city that had foundations whose architect and builder was God. He was looking for a city built by God. That's, that's, that's a good city. Just saying. The book of Revelation tells us all about the city that God will build one day. It gives us dimensions and it it describes it. It tells us that God will be the light of that city. There won't need to be a sun anymore because God will be the light. That's pretty cool. And it's real. And Abraham was looking for that city, the city built by God. And I think we can reflect on our own lives and ask the question, Who is building the city of your life? Are you building it? Or are you allowing God to build it? There's so many illustrations. Maybe you remember the story where Jesus said, the foolish man builds his house on the sand and the storms come and the winds blow and the house falls down. But the wise man builds his house on the rock and that rock is the word of God. The foundations of that city are God and his word and his promises and his revelation to us. Build your life there and not on the sand. And so many of us are satisfied with sand castles when God has in mind for us something eternal. 
I mean, we're like the little pig that built his house out of straw, right? Or out of sticks. And God has something better in mind for us, something permanent, something of substance. He calls us to a better place, but we are satisfied with so little. We're satisfied with the mundane, everyday things that come before us. We're, we're satisfied with a little drink and a little sex and a little power and a little money. And God has infinite treasures in store for us in a better place. We're like, that's okay, I'm, I'll just stay right here. He's calling us to a better place. And by faith, Abraham obeyed. Hey, let me read some more scripture to you this morning, okay? That, that talks about our satisfaction with this place and instead of looking forward to the better place that God has for us. Here's what James says. Let me tell you who James is. James was the brother of Jesus. He was the half-brother of Jesus. He was the son of Mary and Joseph. Jesus, of course, was born of Mary, but Joseph was not his biological father because Jesus did not have a biological father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Scripture says. Uh, Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born. We believe all that stuff. We think it's real. It's true. But James came later. He was Jesus' half-brother. And when Jesus was alive and preaching, James thought Jesus was crazy. And he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah who he claimed to be. But after Jesus rose from the dead, James was like, oh, I get it now. And he became a follower of Jesus. And in his letter, in, in the epistle, the letter of James, he starts off by saying, I am James, a servant of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that's my bro. He says, I'm his servant. So that's who James is. But listen to what James says in chapter four, verse four. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's pretty straightforward, right? James does not mince words. He does not pull any punches. Let me read you another one out of the book of 1 John. This is written by John, one of Jesus' disciples. 1 John 2, 15. John says... Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're called to a better place. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this age or to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And in Colossians chapter three, verse two, the apostle Paul says it this way, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Abraham was called to a better place and he obeyed. And we are called to a better place and we must by faith obey. And we, we have the warnings of the New Testament that say friendship with God is being an enemy, friendship with the world is being an enemy of God. Don't love the world because that means you don't have the love of the Father in you. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. He's calling us to a better place. And this morning, I just wonder, have any of you been called to a better place, but you haven't said yes you haven't obeyed. You know there's some stuff that you need to leave behind. You know there's some stuff that you're hanging on to. You know there's some stuff that you're putting your security in and your hopes in and you, and you find your identity and your purpose in and he's calling us to a better place and you're like, oh, but I really like it. By faith, when Abraham was called, obeyed, obeyed. He was called to a better place. This morning, some of you have been trying to justify the place where you're at. It's not that big a deal. It's not that bad. I mean, God loves me after all, right? Everything's gonna be fine. And he's calling you up out of it. And you're like, uh, maybe later. I got some things to do 
first, God. Maybe later, maybe, you know, maybe when I'm old and I can't have fun anymore, then I'll follow you, says every teenager ever. <laughs> no, he's calling us to something better, a better place. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Now, let's get to the next one. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better people. So let me, let me talk about that. Verse 11. By faith, even Sarah, that is the wife of Abraham, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, that is Abraham, in fact, from one man as good as dead, because he was an old man, came offspring Listen, as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable or uncountable as the grains of sand along the seashore. There is a promise of a people that would come from the line of Abraham. God had promised Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. The problem was Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 and they still didn't have any kids. So how in the world is that going to work? But God showed himself faithful. And it tells us that both Sarah and Abraham believed that God would fulfill his promise. And God gave them a son. His name was Isaac. But more than that, remember at the beginning we started talking about this idea that Abraham is the father of faith. And all of those who come to God by faith are Abraham's children. And this morning, if you have come to God in faith to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are Abraham's children and you are in that number of innumerable offspring as much as the stars of the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. We are Abraham's offspring. We are part of this better people that God was calling Abraham to. He said, Abraham, it'd be cool if I gave you a son because you're 100. I mean, that would be really cool. But I've got an even better thing in mind, that by faith, Abraham, you are going to become the father of them all. All of those who come to be to me by faith, you are Abraham's offspring. You are the people of faith. Are you among that number today? Are you counted as a son or daughter of Abraham, have you come to God in faith to be a part of the better people of God? We are not a people because of Abraham and Sarah's miraculous conception. <laughs> we are a people because of faith in God's revelation of himself to us. Let me read you out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, a familiar verse to many of us. But it says, those who have come to God in faith are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you, called you, called you. Faith starts with God's call. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. A better people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better people. And by faith, we can be numbered among the people of God the descendants of Abraham, the father of faith. I was reading a devotional this morning. I've got a, a book called Morning and Evening. It's a, it was written by Charles Spurgeon, a pastor in the 1800s. And it's just a book, there's a morning devotion and an evening devotion. And uh, I, it sits by a little chair in my house. And so I don't read it every day, but I read it this morning. And it was talking about the reality of being called the people of God. And I, I thought it was, Really good, so let me read it to you this morning. Dear friends, can you by faith see yourselves in that number? 
Can you look up to heaven and say, my Lord and my God, mine by that sweet relationship, which entitles me to call you Father. Mine by that hallowed holy fellowship, which I delight to hold with you when you are pleased to manifest or show yourself unto me as you do not to the rest of the world. Can you read the book of inspiration, the Holy Scripture, and find there the faith, I'm sorry, the, the indentures or those things that mark out salvation? Can you read the title written in precious blood? Can you, by humble faith, lay hold of Jesus' garments and say, my Christ? If you can't, then God hath said of thee and others like thee, my Christ people. For if God be your God and Christ be your Christ, the Lord has a special, peculiar favor for you. You are the object of his choice, accepted in his beloved. You are God's people. That should be precious to us. We are the people of God, called out of darkness into his glorious light. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. And God called Abraham to a better place and Abraham obeyed. And and God promised to Abraham a better people. And by faith, we are the descendants of Abraham by faith, the children of God by faith. This morning, can you count yourself among that number? Spurgeon asks us. Here's the last part, a better promise. By faith, Abraham looked forward to a better promise. I love singing about the promises of God this morning. He is a promise keeper. His word will never fail. My heart will trust you, Jesus. I won't be overwhelmed. My eyes are gonna see miracles and victories because I know that you are a promise keeper. Listen to what Hebrews eleven thirteen says. Speaking of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob, It says, these all died in faith. Although they had not received the things that were promised. (laughs) Now, wait a minute. He calls them to a better place. He calls them to be a better people. And then they die and they didn't receive the promise. What's that all about? Well, maybe there's a better promise. Let's keep going. But they saw them, those promises, from a distance. They greeted them and they confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things about being temporary residents make it clear that they are seeking a different homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they could have just gone back there. They would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God called Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go into a place that I will show you. And Abraham obeyed. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants outnumber the stars and the sand. And yet Abraham had one son. Abraham lived as a foreigner in tents in the land that God sent him to. He never took possession of it. And and he only had one son when he died. And yet he was looking forward to something better. He didn't receive the final promises yet, but he trusted God that they were coming. In fact, let me read you the next part of this story, okay? Verse 17, by faith, when he was tested, Abraham offered up Isaac. He received the promises and yet he was offering his one and only son. In Genesis chapter 25, we see the story, Abraham and Sarah finally have a son named Isaac, the son of promise. And God speaks to Abraham and he says, hey, Abraham, I want you to take your son up on a mountain and I want you to kill him, to sacrifice him. Once again, scripture tells us that Abraham obeyed 
If you know the rest of the story, Abraham goes to the mountain, he makes an altar, he ties up, Isaac lays him, and he's about to plunge a knife into his heart and an angel of the Lord stops the hand of Abraham. And he says, I know you're a man of faith now. (laughs) And then God provides a different sacrifice because there's a ram that's stuck in the bushes. Let me finish reading this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. He received the promises and yet he was offering his one and only son. The one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. Abraham considered God to be able to even raise the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. We ask the question, how could God ask Abraham to do this? And the truth is, it was a hard ask. But Abraham obeyed and God was faithful and had a better plan. And when God provided that ram in the thicket, in the bushes, we got a new name for God. How many of you have ever heard the the term Jehovah Jireh? Jehovah Jireh, it means God is my provider. We we sing songs about it. There, There used to be this one, Jehovah Jireh. My provider, his grace is sufficient for, some of y'all know it. And then, and then there's all kinds of songs, Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider. There's all these songs about Jehovah Jireh, he's the one who provides. We talk about it. When we're in need, we say Jehovah Jireh is my provider. But you know where that story started? It started in Genesis chapter 22. When God called Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac and God stayed his hand and God provided a sacrifice. Genesis 22 verse 14, Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. God called Abraham to a better place that he never experienced in his lifetime. God promised Abraham a better people that he never experienced in his lifetime. Abraham died in faith, looking forward to what would come and trusting that God would truly see it through because Abraham was trusting in a better promise. And if you've been here for our study of the book of Hebrews, We have seen over and over and over that all of the stories in the book of Hebrews that come from the Old Testament are all pointing forward to Jesus Christ. He is the better and final fulfillment of God. We saw back at Easter that he is the better sacrifice of God. Abraham said, you know what? God can even raise up someone from the dead. You know what that's pointing to? Not that Isaac would be raised, that God would give his only son not Abraham, but God would give his one and only son who would truly and really die a literal, actual death and who would be raised back to life truly and actually and literally. It says that Isaac was given back figuratively to Abraham, but Jesus Christ came back not figuratively, but literally in reality. He rose from the dead. So James, his brother said, I'm in, (laughs) I saw it. And this morning, those better promises that God gave Abraham apply to us today too. He has promised us a better place. Jesus said, hey, I'm going away, but if I go, I'm preparing a place for you so that where I am, you may be also, and I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. Scripture says that we can be the people of God. We read it out of 1 Peter chapter 2. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We were not a people, but now we are the people of God. And it's all based on the better promises of Jesus, which we see a shadow and a picture of in the life of Abraham and Isaac, but better and finally and, re- and, and fulfilled 
in reality and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this morning, Jesus is the better promise who makes us a better people and prepares for us a better place. And this morning, when he calls you, will you obey? This morning, when he calls you, will you obey? Will you say yes? Will you get up and leave the place where you've been to go to the better place that he has for you? Will you leave the, the people behind that are not the people of God to, to be gathered together with God's people, to be numbered in every nation and tribe and tongue that will one day in heaven at the feet of Jesus bow down and say, holy, 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 hallelujah, praise the Lord. He calls us and by faith, we can obey. This morning, he is calling you. Maybe you are a believer in here this morning, but, but you're kind of holding on to, to this place a little more than you should. Abraham did that too. If we went through the book of Genesis and looked at all of Abraham's life, he was not a perfect man. And we're not gonna be perfect when we come to Jesus for salvation. We'll have mistakes and we'll have failures, but the key is that we continue to hold on to him, that we persevere to the end with faith in him and he'll clean us up and he'll pick us up and he'll dust us off. But maybe you're a believer in here and you've been holding on to the place where you are instead of going forward to where God has called you to be. Maybe it's been more important for you to be among the people who you identify with, the people that make you feel good, the people that, but the truth is that's all temporary stuff. That's not God's people. God has a better purpose for you. He's called you to be the people of God. And it's all based on better promises that he will fulfill. And this morning you can trust him. You can be satisfied in him. Stand up with me this morning. We're gonna sing a song and while we sing, we're gonna have an opportunity to respond. So this morning as you've heard the word of God preached, just like Abraham who responded by saying yes, we're called to respond too. We don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Jesus said this all the time, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. That means listen and obey, listen and obey. And so this morning, maybe some of you need to obey today. You've been hearing it, you've been hearing about it, you've been thinking about it, but you haven't obeyed. And maybe it's to lay down some sin pattern in your life. Maybe it's to come and finally fully surrender your life to Jesus Christ for salvation. I don't know what it is, but if he calls you by faith, obey. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. Thank you that your word is truth. Help us to obey, to live lives of faith and obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this morning, I invite you to respond. You can come down to the front and pray. There would be those who would be willing to pray with you. But if he calls you, obey this morning. <laughs>